Okay, hello, I'm sorry about that. Um, all right, I'm gonna start by talking about innate, by talking about innate principles that I didn't get to the last time. Um, and after I finish that, I'm gonna talk about um, primary and secondary qualities. All right, so, So what um, is or would be an innate principle? Of course, Locke thinks there aren't any innate principles. So if you say, what is an innate principle? The answer is nothing, there aren't any. But what is it supposed to be? <laughs> um, so uh, it doesn't just mean innate knowledge. Um, it's supposed to be, uh, that is, it's not It's not just propositions that we're born knowing, so to speak, whatever that means. It's supposed to be propositions that are, that are fit to serve as principles. Right, so a principle is like, is like a first principle. Right? I mean, principle actually means first, basically, right? So a principle is like uh, something you could uh, derive the whole structure of our knowledge from. Um, so uh, this is why, first of all, like these kind of um, innate, I, ideas that are innate just in the sense that perhaps they were acquired in the womb, right? Like the idea of warmth or something like that. Um, so, I mean, Locke says, first of all, that's not really what I mean by innate, but, um, but it's like, I think more importantly, you couldn't use those to form first principles of our knowledge. Right, the first principle I know is supposed to be these things like it is impossible for the same thing both to be and not to be, which is roughly the principle of contradiction, something like that. Um, they're not supposed to be things like um, warmth is pleasant, <laughs> right? I mean, you're not going to get very far with that as the first principle of your knowledge. Um, and similarly, when Locke talks about innate practical principles, right? So remember, there's two there's two kinds. Speculative, that is theoretical and practical. So the speculative principles would be the principles that we can derive all our knowledge from. The practical innate principles would supposedly be the first principles we can um, derive what we should do from, right? So they're like first principles of ethics. Right? So like an example of this that Locke keeps discussing is um, do as you would be done by. Um, so about those, Locke says, this is um, book one, chapter three, section three on page 76. Um, um, Practical principles derived from nature are there for operation and must produce conformity of action, not barely speculative assent to their truth, or else they are in vain distinguished from speculative maxims. Right. So a practical principle would have would be for the purpose of like us knowing what we're supposed to do. Um, so things that are supposed to be practical principles but don't produce any effect, but we think they're true. Um, uh, would like not be fit to serve as 
practical first principles, even if they were innate. Okay, so that's so that's what we're looking for. We're looking for these innate principles. Um, and um, and what does it mean that they're innate? Well, Locke says they would have to be innate impressions. And what does it mean to be an innate impression? So this is book one, chapter two, section five on page 60. So he's talking about why we would all, if there were innate principles, we would all have to assent to them. So this is for innate speculative principles. For innate practical principles, we would all have to obey them. For innate speculative principles, we would all have to assent to them because assent must needs be the necessary concomitant of all innate truths. It seemed to me near a contradiction to say that there are truths imprinted on the soul which it perceives or understands not. Imprinting, if it signify anything, being nothing else but the making certain truths to be perceived. Right, so that there are innate truths means that um, there's propositions we assent to from the time we're born. As opposed to like innate faculties, capabilities. So Locke doesn't deny that we have those. Or for that matter, like innate tendencies. Locke doesn't deny we have those, but neither of those would count could could produce innate principles because innate principles are not are supposed to be not just things that we could assent to, they're things that we do assent to. And he says, like, otherwise, what does it mean that they're in the mind when we're born? I mean, because like, at least as he portrays it, what's the alternative? What else could it mean that it's innate? Well, it could mean that we're like born capable of knowing. But he says, we're born capable of knowing everything that we're ever gonna. Moreover, we're born capable of things that we're never gonna. <laughs> right? Like, uh, you know, no doubt I'm, I'm capable of knowing what's behind that wall over there, but I probably never will unless I go around this building and why would I do that? Right? So I'm capable of it. I was born capable of knowing it, but that doesn't make it innate. I don't even know it at all, right? So an innate principle would have to be something. Now, I mean, I think the question is exactly how uh, strong this is. Um, I used to think he meant that um, we would actually have to have been thinking of them constantly since we were born. <laughs> now, I mean, that obviously is not anything any of his opponents maintain, right? So, like, I mean, he said he would be saying, but what else could you mean? Um, I don't think he means that, but he does think that it means that every time the proposition occurs to me now, it occurs to me with the sign of memory, right? Like as something that I already knew. And he says, um, that's just not true of these principles, right? When we first learn them, we don't think, oh, I remember. So, um, so, uh, 
So since there's nothing like that, there's no innate principles. Um, or I guess maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. How do we know there's nothing? He says, if there were something like that, everyone, yeah, I guess you could put it this way. Everyone would have to assent to it innately, meaning everyone would have to assent to it. And when they assent to it, they would have to remember that they already assented to it before. And so that's one thing about innate principles. So, I mean, actually, so I've, I've listed two things about them. Number one, they have to be suited to be principles. Number two, we have to, every time we assent to them, we have to remember having assent to them before. And finally, apparently, innate principles, because they're innate, would have to be natural to the beings that have them. Now, like Locke doesn't say this explicitly, but I don't know how else to understand this argument. So the argument is, so first of all, the argument that his opponents make in favor of the innateness of the principles is universal consent. Like sense. I think of the same thing in this, in this context, right? Everyone assents to it. And Locke says, sure enough, if they were innate, everyone would have to assent to them. He, he also says, just because everyone assented to them didn't wouldn't show that they were innate. Yeah. In the reading, he also uses this term that to be an innate idea, he doesn't mention where, but he says that we bring it into reality with us. There was a one of the sections I remember we used that term. Yeah, well, we would have to bring it with us when we're born. That is, we would have to always have it with us. My, my question was for the TA, I don't think it was answered uh, my thinking, but uh, it was, it's like, I feel like then the distinction between empiricism and rationalism isn't really worth noting because Descartes' fundamental principle was realized rather than brought into reality. Or it's like looking through so that was brought into reality that was realized after the fact and made into a soul. Okay, I mean, if you're saying that Descartes doesn't, um, but Descartes does think there are innate principles. Uh, does he mean by that what Locke says he has to mean? No, probably not. Uh, Locke would say, but there isn't anything else for him to mean, so it doesn't make sense. But I'm not sure if that's what you're asking about. Or I mean, I think this thing about bringing things into reality is, is, is like probably confusing here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bring that in. The, the question here about it is, is like, have we always known it? And what does that mean? So like, you know, Descartes thinks, for example, the meditator, you know, um, says at one point, um, I'm not sure if God exists, I have to prove it. But then says afterwards, that God has imprinted me with the knowledge of his existence as an innate principle. So what does that mean exactly? Well, if we were back in 100 B, I would start talking, but since we're not, I won't. All right, but it, you know, so he's at least trying to mean something that different, some alternative to it, other than the ones that Locke has on offer. Um, but I'm here I'm trying to understand Locke's argument. So, so again, Locke says, my opponents, and you know, I, I don't know exactly who he's thinking of, who these opponents are. I mean, maybe Descartes is supposed to be one of them, but for example, Descartes doesn't make this argument about universal. Is it necessary that he have anybody definitely in mind? Because to, to my reading of it, it sort of seems like he is consciously inventing a fake opponent. 
because his argument against that opponent is useful <laughs> to get to the point he really wants to make. Which is like, I mean, that's what Plato does all the time, right? Yeah. Nobody actually made the stupid arguments that Plato rebuffs. Uh, Maybe. So. All right. Let's yeah. Let's not get into Plato interpretation, which is even harder. I I would just say I, I, it seems like Locke starts by saying everyone agrees that there are these innate principles, and these are the arguments they give, and whatever. I I don't think he's just inventing. I think you may be thinking of Neoplatonists or something. I'm not sure, actually. I'm sure someone knows what thinks they know. <laughs> but anyway, it's true. It doesn't really matter for our purposes. So, so his opponents, whoever they are, make this argument. Everyone assents to it, so they must be in it. So he says, and like this is this is like the pattern of like Locke always beats his opponent into the ground. You know? So he says, first of all. If there were universal consent, that wouldn't show that they're innate. And second of all, there isn't universal consent. <laughs> right. So if there were universal consent, that wouldn't show that they were innate because there may be some other reason why everyone assets to them. Um, right. Like as he's going to say about the supposed innate idea of God, he says, it's, it's that's talking about innate idea rather than innate proposition, but it's the same type of argument. His opponents say, everyone has this idea. Locke says, well, number one, if everyone did have the idea, that wouldn't show it's innate. Because for example, everyone has the idea of fire because there's fire everywhere. So everyone has seen it, <laughs> right? Um, but it's not innate. If people were raised on an island with no fire, they wouldn't have that concept, right? They wouldn't, they wouldn't have that idea. Um, and then he also says, but moreover, not everyone has this idea of God, so, right? So it's the same thing here. He's going to say universal assent wouldn't prove it, but number two, there isn't universal assent. Okay, so what does universal assent mean? I mean, it doesn't mean cats assert assent. I have a, a question kind of related to that, although it gets to some reports in chapter two, or book, uh, the re reading two, I should say, about like who is counted when he talks about universal assent. Because in the readings for today, he has a lot to say about the brutes. And I'm not clear, like, are brutes uh, people below a certain intellectual no. threshold, or are they animals? Or are they maybe some of it makes it sound like maybe he's talking about slaves, which is not so good? Okay. So no. he's talking about like a, a domestic is a, animals. Is a non human animal. Okay. Right? I mean, he doesn't call them animals because we're also animals. <laughs> and he's, he uses the word beast sometimes too. So beast beast also, also, the beast beast is also yeah. He talks about like how a brute can distinguish his master, but not. Yeah, like other brutes, and I'm like, uh oh. No, he's talking this about a dog. Seems pretty iffy, John. No, no, he's talking about a dog. Well, so um, so brutes are excluded from universal assent. Their assent is irrelevant. Right, but the question. So that's what I was starting to say. Right, when I when his opponents claim that there's universal assent, they're not claiming that cats assent to, them. and so Locke is not going to provide cats as a counter. Right, like he's not going to say no. There's no universal assent. Cats don't assent. To so, but he does provide the, the counter examples that he provides are infants and idiots, right? So idiots means, or and I think uh, like some idiots, that is the ones that show no sign of rational uh, cognition or whatever. Um, by idiots, he means cognitively disabled people. I don't think that, I think this word sounded kind of clinical, right? It's like, a, it's a Greek word. Okay. I, I don't think it had the pejorative sound that it does now, but it's hard to be sure. But anyway, so, right, he says that infants don't assent to these principles, right? Like, so do infants assent that? It is impossible for the same thing both to be and not to be. I mean, maybe Descartes or Leibniz would say yes, but Locke says obviously not. They don't understand what 
what impossibility is, what being is, right? So they can't possibly assent to it. And similarly, these um, quote unquote idiots uh, are, you know, don't understand these, these principles and therefore don't assent to them. So the question is like, why are these counterexamples? That is apparently his opponents. Now, of course, did his opponents really claim that infants and idiots assent to these principles? Um, I don't know, but Locke thinks that they're, Locke takes it that they're bound to include those, right? In a way that they're not bound to include cats. Because he says, since these people don't assent to it, obviously there's no universal set, and therefore they're not in it. Yes. So within Locke's conception of assent or consent, is this idea of understanding that is maybe absent from the rational side. You have to understand them, whereas somebody else might claim, oh, like the shape of a triangle is so fundamental that it doesn't require understanding to know that this is a triangle or like insert, I don't know. Right, or like impossibility. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So, um, um, am I right? Is that the wait? I didn't hear part of it because the the but the the, the rational it, the, it Locke is saying that understanding is crucial to assent. Yes. Whereas somebody else, one of his opponents might claim it's so fundamental that it doesn't need to be understood or that it's innately understood. Yeah, I think innately understood is what they would have to say. Okay. But I don't see how they could say that you could assent to it without understanding. Gotcha. Okay. But but they might say that you could that you could assent to it without realizing that you understand it, without realizing that you assent to it. Gotcha. And then but then Locke will say, well, you know, in that case, why not say you assent to everything you're ever going to know, right? I mean, yeah. so like it, I I it, it's not my interest here is not actually in figuring out who's right in this argument. <laughs> My interest is in figuring out why Locke thinks that these have to be included. <laughs> it's like why his opponents have to include them. And that's why I started saying something like um, if they were innate, they would have to be natural to the kind of things that have them. And one of the kinds of things that have them, well, so that's a good question. But I think Locke believes that his opponents have no alternative but to think of the things that, that assent to these principles as humans or as men, as he's going to put it. We're not going to talk about that yet. Yes. So it seems like most people thinking about the mind now and most of the rationalists have this idea that there can be stuff unconsciously in the mind, right? There, there's some kind of an unconscious mind. Um, Locke pretty much does buy it, right? Like that's, or it's like that's what he's saying when he says, "Well, if I'm not conscious of it, how can it possibly be impressed in my mind?" Yeah. Like, what does it mean for it to be in yeah, my mind? Yes. He essentially is saying there is no unconscious, which yeah. is. I wouldn't say that's rationalist versus empiricist. It's, you know, well, Descartes no, and Locke term unconscious is much later, but like no, but I'm saying, but, but well, it's not that much. Like Leibniz does. I don't know if he calls it. He doesn't call it the unconscious, right? But he says that there's um, representations or ideas in our mind that we're not conscious of. Um, I think Descartes and Locke agree about this, and, and Leibniz disagree. Um, and Kant agrees with Leibniz. So yeah, so that is behind a lot of things, right? It's like um, 
that yeah, Locke says, what does it mean for so you know, so that there's a there's a fast answer. This was this was responsible for my old bad way of understanding what Locke thinks the innate principle would have to be like. The, like the fast answer is for something to be in your mind means that you're thinking of it right now. <laughs> so you have to be conscious of it. But actually, I mean, he does have this um, um, looser understanding of what it is to be in your mind, where something can be in your mind by quote unquote being in your memory. And being in your memory means that you can think it later, and when you think it later, you'll realize that you've already thought it before. So, but it isn't really anywhere while you're not thinking, right? Like ideas aren't really anywhere when you're not while you're not conscious of them. But there's just like a capability of bringing them back. Um. Right. Um, so, but we'll see later that when Locke talks about the term human or man, he's going to say that what we mean by this is basically a certain shape. Right? In other words, that, that the, our idea of human is based on the one that can be defined as featherless biped, not the one that can be defined as rational animal. He's going to just try to prove that from the way, like, like he says, suppose you found a rational parrot. Would you say it's a human with feathers? No, you would say it's a parrot with rationality, <laughs> right? Therefore, you're really counting things as humans that have this shape, so to speak. And therefore, you're, right, you're counting these as humans, even if they're not rational. Whereas a rational parent wouldn't count as a human. Okay, yes, question. Um, on universal on like, things that fall into the human category of things, where would, like, because Rock brings it up later about like how people can have dual senses, which also cause, like, Thing to cause you to see things differently because we aren't able to fully sense to it because either be like age or you just don't have it, you don't have the ability. Like, you're yeah. blind. But so, 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 what do you ask? I mean, so these supposed you know, like innate principles are, are, are framed in terms of things like impossible and being that don't belong to a particular sense. What I'm asking is, in the block definition of a human, does, does it just ignore the things like senses, even if it has uh, like filled senses, or does it have more to do with just the construction and shape of the human? So, I mean, first of all, when you call this Locke's definition of human, again, this is Locke's explanation of what we mean by the word human. Right, like he's trying to figure out what idea we attach to the word human. In the same context where he does that, he's going to basically say, and therefore this word picks, picks out a morally irrelevant characteristic. Right, like what the the rational parrot is, you know, um, I think. There's, there's nowhere he explicitly says this, either here or in the second treatise, but I think it follows from the whole way he thinks about these things, that like a rational parrot could be a citizen of our state, right? There's, what's needed for that is not being featherless. <laughs> what's needed for that is the ability to understand reward and punishment. And therefore, to enter into uh, the kind of social contract that creates a, a, a commonwealth or state, right? So, um, and similarly, like he's, you know, he says there, like, um, why would you think that th that whether someone is like going to be uh, rewarded or punished in the afterlife depends on whether they're this shape. 
like whether they have quote unquote a soul, which we'll see for him really is not the right question. But anyway, like whether they're immortal in that sense, why would that depend on their, their shape? He says, you might as well make it depend on their clothes. Um, and then when you say to him, wait, are you saying that idiots don't have a soul and they won't be uh, rewarded in the afterlife? He says, um, that's not up to me. God decides what to do about that. <laughs> he says, it's enough for us to know that if we are rational, we can expect them <laughs> and leave that up to, you know, right. So, um, so what I so what I'm what I'm getting at here, and you know, I have to like look ahead at the things I know Locke is going to say later to say this, that I think Locke's argument is is directed specifically at his opponents, right? That is that his opponents would have to admit that since these people are human, they also have to ascend because they don't have any other way to to like join together the type of thing that's natural. Um, um, and they don't because um, they don't because they don't agree that moral principles are learned from experience by reasoning. Because they think moral principles are based on innate practical principles. Right? Moral laws is to do some innate practical principles. So uh, like Locke can explain rational beings are able to arrive at moral truths and non-rational beings are not. Because here's how you arrive at those truths. But they say, we have them because they're imprinted in us. Well, what, couldn't they be imprinted in here too? Why not? Um, all right, so that's that's the best way I can understand that argument. Um, the, moral, like the divine morals of God that we can't access and reach. What would be the good of that? Well, I mean, I didn't say that their name, but I just remember reading a section where he talks about how God has moral principles that we can't understand, even if we try to understand them, and they're going to be diluted by the impurity of our thoughts. Yeah, no, I don't think I, I don't think that, that what you were reading meant exactly what you thought it was. Um, um, he says, okay, so like part of this argument here, I, I mean, I've tried not to go into all of this argument because I want to get on to the rest of the new reading. <laughs> um, but, you know, so so like part of this argument, so first of all, he says another reason he says we can't have innate principles is because we don't have innate concepts. I was talking about that before, right? So like we aren't born with the concept of impossibility, that is innate ideas, right? So we aren't born with the idea of impossibility, the idea of God, the idea of worship, whatever. We're not born with those. Um, and his opponents say, well, but it's suitable to the goodness of God that we should be born with the idea of God. And therefore he must have given it to us. And at that point, Locke says, um, well, uh, um, he says, that's backwards. It's not quite that simple, even according to him. But he says, that's backwards. He says, if you know that God did something, you can conclude from that, that um, it was suitable to the goodness of God. But you can't conclude from what you think is suitable to the goodness of God, that God did it. <laughs> Right, and he says, like, for example, it would be suitable to the goodness of God to give us all the ideas we're ever going to need. This is actually very similar to an argument the meditator makes at some point. But we don't have all the ideas we're ever going to need, so obviously we're mistaken about what, you know. But it, it, that's not the same as saying that God has moral principles that we don't know about. Um, I think... 
the idea of moral principles that rational beings can't know about for Locke doesn't make sense because um, as we'll see when he gets to, to talk about moral uh, law in, um, in this book or about morality in this book, he's going to say morality is a type of law. And law, of course, requires promulgation to the people who are going to be um, uh, under its jurisdiction. And it requires it because otherwise it's totally ineffective. Right? Like for me to make a law and not tell it to me is not going to give you an even if I've attached punishments and rewards to it, it's not gonna get you to do anything, <laughs> right? Like I secretly make a plan that I'm gonna reward you if you do this and punish you if you do that. But right, that's not gonna affect how you act because you don't know. So what would be the purpose of making a law like that? So there can't be a law like that. So there can't be moral laws that aren't knowable by us. Yeah. So I walked this to the example of like thieves, right? It was like, you know, like it's the law to not steal and not kill, but to thieves, they choose to ignore the not the not stealing, but they can still honor the not killing, it's like laws. Well no, I think it's that they don't steal from each other. They, they they steal they kill and steal from everyone else. But but it's almost like the point of like they have like their own laws that are clearly they clearly show that not all laws are universal. Right. That's part of so um, we so most of the arguments I've been talking about so far have been arguments about the speculative against the speculative innate principles. Against the practical innate principles, he says that it's even more clear that there's no universal assent to. Basically, because of all the usual arguments about cultural relativism, right? Like what people think is good in one place, people think is bad in another place. So there's no universal assent. Um, uh, and the thing about the thieves is like a sub, sub argument of that, right? It's like them trying to claim, well, but like, making, keeping promises and whatever are really are universally assented to, even thieves do it. And he says, well, no, they don't. They do it with each other, but they don't do it with everyone else. And he says, if we were really an innate practical principle, it would always govern them. It wouldn't only be with each other. <laughs> um, so what's going on there is something different. He says, sure enough, that, like the reason moral law is what it is, is because it's, that, that it's for everyone's, it's in everyone's best interest if everyone acts that way. So it's definitely possible to figure, for people to figure out without understanding the obligation that they should act that way sometimes, or at least that they should tell other people to act that way, right? So he says like, you know, once you realize that it's better for you if no one steals from you and kills you, um, even if you think it's better for you if you steal from other people and kill them, uh, you're still going to go around telling people don't steal, don't kill, right? Because that's for your own benefit. <laughs> okay. So, social contract theory. Well, that, so the social contract that person is not really, right? That person is not really accepted a social contract, the person I'm talking about, right? Like they have it in mind to violate all these things themselves, but they're just trying to tell, get everyone else to. All right. Um, social agreement, social contract. <laughs> all right. Um, I got into, because there were a lot of good questions, I got into a lot of things I didn't plan to, and this came out kind of, uh, disorganized, but um, right. I don't have more things to say about innate principles. Are there more questions about innate principles? Okay. Um,
meeting, right? So what I was really doing right now is trying to like, and this is the kind of thing you're being asked to do on the final paper. And to, in a more limited way on the two, two first writing assignments, like you look at something and try to figure out what it means. I wasn't trying to figure out if it was right or I was just trying to figure out what he actually means, right? Like, why would you think that your opponents have to accept this? You must think that innate principles have to be this, right? Could that be because you think this? No, because I know somewhere else he says the opposite. So it must be, right? And like, I'm not sure I'm right, but that's the kind of argument that you have to make. Um, um, okay, so now for something completely different, I'm gonna talk about mechanism. This is something for people who are in 100B, this is kind of like a repeat, <laughs> but it's, it's, um, it's obviously fundamental in both courses. I guess more so in 100B. Well, anyway, so a body. And by body here, I mean like not just a human body or something like that, but you know, body in the broad sense that even like the air in this room is a body. Right, so a body is something that's extended. That is, it takes up space. Now, the body isn't the extension itself. The body is what is extended. So it's that is, it's an extended substance. We'll see Locke talking more about our idea of substance and whether we have one and what it's like. But, um, and again, if you're wondering, if he, he's heard enough about substances to uh, um, last a lifetime. But, um, but basically, a substance is something that has properties. Now you can understand it in this context, right? So the body is something that has the property of extension, of like taking up space. So because it takes up space, it has to have certain other properties. It has to have a size, or as Locke usually says, bulk. Again, I think bulk is his name for what we would call volume, right? Like three-dimensional size. So it has to have a size, it has to have a shape, Figure. Um, it has to have a position, right? So but it has to have a size because it can't take up space without taking up some amount of space. It has to have a shape because it can't take up space without like there being a limit to the shape, to the space that it takes up. It has to have a position because it has to take up now, like like Locke will think that this is a relative position, right? It's measured relative to some other bodies. It has to have that kind of relative position because it has to take up some space rather than some other space, <laughs> right? That is so it has to be either this one or this one relative to this third body. Um and it has to have motion or rest, right? Because if it takes up space now and it still takes up space later, then it's either the same space or a different space. So it's a different space, it moved, and if it's the same space, it was at rest. Um, so an extended substance has to have all these properties. And furthermore, I keep saying that it takes up space. What does taking up space mean? Well, it means that no other body can be in the same space while it's there, right? It excludes other bodies from the, the space that it's in. So as long as my body is here, no other body can be in there.
And Locke, unlike Descartes, but like most other people who have a view like this, think that means a body has to have a power of resisting any other body entering in space. Right? So if another body tries to come here, this one will resist it. And in fact, Locke says the resistance is absolute. Right? Like no matter how hard you push this body, it will never go into this one. So this one, of course, could move out of the way. But if it's trapped and has nowhere to move, there's it's will absolutely resist anything else coming in. Yeah. What about like atoms squared? Well, atoms, you know, were <laughs> not um, what we call atoms were not discovered yet, right? I was curious about that. But I mean, but of course, like, um, it's true that bodies can be divided. Right? Locke says all bodies are divisible. Um, how do we know that is a good question. But leave that aside for a second. So, like, if there were enough room for the two parts of this body to go apart, then this one might be able to go in that one. Right? So, so like, that's what Locke calls hardness, right? Like, like the cohesion of the parts. You know, if this body is very hard, then it will take a lot of force to get it to split into two parts. But this body could be very soft, right? It could be the air inside a football. Um, so it's very, right, air is very soft in the sense that it's easy to get it to split into two parts, right? I just... You know, here it's undivided, and I just move my hand, and now it's divided. Easy, right? But if it's trapped and it can't move apart, it, because it's inside this football, Locke says, press however hard, you'll never be able to make it smaller or get into its space. Yeah. Um, something that like Locke uses when he's talking about solidity, he says it's fine if you want to call it impenetrability, even though that doesn't really capture all it is. Is that is that like what it has to do with of like the ability to like penetrate something like like the air or like another person? But you can't like walk through another person. You can walk through air. Right, but you don't really penetrate the air is what Locke is saying. It just flows around you. Right? So like here's the air. And here's you, and when you quote unquote walk through the air, so now you're in here, but the air has actually moved. You know, there's some air now up here or down here. You pushed it out of the way. And you could do the same thing with a wall if you if you walked hard enough. <laughs> right? Um, uh, but he's saying what you can't do is keep everything completely enclosed in, so that it can't move apart and then walk through it. And you can't just because this is the property that makes it a body, that it takes up space and excludes all other bodies. And, right, and as you were just saying, Locke's name for um, that property of bodies, well, I mean, we'll see, I have to change that a little bit. But, I mean, or use it for that property of bodies and something else. But, right, so solidity is that fact that the body takes up space and excludes any other body from it while it's there. And, yeah, and he says, if you think this isn't the right use of solidity, so like there are other ways of using solidity or like solid, right? Like the geometrical definition of solid, I think is one that he has in mind. So like that's that's not what he means by solid, right? That just means three-dimensionality. That's not what he means by solidity here. So he says like, if you don't like the word solidity, call it something else like impenetrability, but I think this is a better word for it.
Okay, so this solidity is a power that the body has. It's a, a power, a faculty, a capability that the body has, right? Like here's the body, and it has this faculty of solidity. And this faculty of solidity is in act, it's operating when the body is actually resisting another body trying to come into its space. Right? So the operation of the faculty or power of solidity is resistance. But, and this is the weird thing, Locke says that um, this power is also the quality of solidity in the following sense. So like, here's the mind. And remember, this is what happens when we perceive an idea. The external body has a power that we call a quality. And the quality is able to cause my mind to have carry out this act of perception. This is the operation of our act of perception. And the immediate object of this act of perception is the idea, right? So you can sort of use the same word for, although Locke says, you really shouldn't, but then he says that he admits that he's going to. But in fact, not only is he going to, but he's already been doing it. <laughs> right? You can sort of use the same word for both the quality and the idea. Right? Like you could call this the idea of whiteness. If this was a snowball. You could call this the idea of whiteness, and you could call this the quality of whiteness. Right, so the quality of whiteness would be the power of the snowball to cause me to perceive the idea of what. So Locke says that, say this idea is the idea of solidity. So the quality in that's in any body to cause me to, to perceive that idea of solidity is the quality of solidity. But Locke says, it's also the power to resist another body moving into your space. This is the weird part. Yeah. Is he saying that the quality of solidity is what gives rise to the idea of a body or just specifically of the body's solidity? Well, it's just specifically of the body's solidity, although he says solidity is what's most essential to the body, right? So it's like, like I mean, that is because if by a body you mean an extended substance, the main point is it takes up space, that is, right? Um, but but again, the thing that's so the thing that's weird about it is that the idea of solidity is a simple idea which can't be, therefore it can't be defined. It's like the color yellow or the taste of a pineapple. Um, right, so like book two, chapter four, section six on page 128. If anyone asks me what this solidity is, I send him to his senses to inform him. Let him put a flint or a football between his hands and then endeavor to join them and he will know. Right? It's just like if someone asks you, what is yellow? You can't define it, but well, the chalk in this room is white. I usually have something yellow. <laughs> if someone asks you, what is white? You can't define it. Maybe you could, but never mind. You can't define it. You have to show it to them. Then they'll know. 
right? So Locke says solidity is like that. If you ask me, what is this idea of solidity? Um, I can't tell you. You just have to take a body between your hands and push them together, and then you'll then you'll get that idea. But um, nevertheless, somehow we know something about the the substance that caused us to perceive this idea, besides just that it caused us to perceive this idea. That's what's strange here. Right, like from, from perceiving the idea of white, I know that whatever's there has the quality of whiteness. That is that it has the ability to cause me to perceive white. And that's all I know by perceiving white. I mean, in that sense, even when I'm a dream, in a dream and I perceive white, there's something that caused me to perceive white. And that thing, I guess you should say, has the quality of whiteness, even if it's like a part of my brain or whatever, <laughs> right? I don't know anything about it other than it gets me to perceive the color white. But in the case of solidity, Locke is saying, we learn something else about the thing that caused it. Namely, that will never allow my hands to come together. Right? So there's something we can say about the cause of this idea of solidity, besides just that it's the cause that is the cause of perceiving the idea of solidity, besides just that it's the cause of perceiving this idea of solidity. Um, I can say, and this is how he first introduces it, right? So chapter four, book two, chapter four, section one, the idea of solidity we receive by our touch, and it arises from the resistance which we find in body to the entrance of any other body into, pla into the place it possesses. Um, till it has left it, <laughs> right? So we know this, in the case of this idea, we know that the quality it arises from is also the power to resist another body moving into your space. And um, kind of spoiler alert, I think that that feature of the idea of solidity, that somehow we learn something about its object in addition to just the fact that it has the power to cause us to perceive that idea, is what makes it a quote unquote primary quality. Okay, but not, I'm not getting to that yet. So, so, so back to this. So, um, this is what a body. These are the properties that a body must have. And mechanism is basically the doctrine that these are all the properties that a body really has. Right. So, other properties that you might think a body has, like color or. or um, whatever, are not really in the body. Um, and it's called mechanism because if this is what a body is, and you ask, okay, so how can a one body affect another body? So, right, like if you think bodies have other properties that are really in them, like magnetic moment or whatever, right? Or, or mass for that matter. Um, then uh, you might think there's lots of ways one body can affect another body. For example, this one could attract this one at a distance because of its mass, right? But if you think the only properties that bodies have are the ones on this list, how can they affect each other? Well, this limits and at the same time seems to explain how they can affect each other. They can affect each other because 
each one excludes the other one from the space that it's in. So if this one is moving this way, and it comes and it, and it hits this one, then either this one has to move or this one has to stop. <laughs> right? So they can affect each other by pushing. Right? And again, this is why this is called mechanism. Like it means that everything works the way a machine works by things pushing each other. So, I mean, this view, like, um, dangerous to say this, but it like, seems to originate with Galileo, actually, the early modern version of it, anyway. I mean, it was known that in ancient times people had views something like this, but it seems to originate with Galileo, um, uh, Descartes, um, although he doesn't believe in solidity, but other than that, he's a mechanist. Um, and uh, Locke's mentor, Boyle, um, was a mechanist. But uh, uh, they don't all necessarily mean the same thing by it, right? Because I just said, so the view is that these are the properties that are really in bodies. The other ones, and so what do the other ones come from? We think they're in bodies, but they're really in us somehow. But there's basically two questions about that. One is, like, what do you mean really in bodies? I mean, we go back to whiteness. Um, this body for sure has a quality that causes me to perceive that idea. So if you call this whiteness, the but their whiteness is in the body. But so, like, you have to be careful somehow to explain what the difference is between the ideas we have that are of properties that are really in the body and the ideas we have of properties that are not really in the body, but we're just like projecting them, right? It's not clear exactly what that means. Um, Right, so so like as far as Locke goes, there's two questions about this. Like, what do you mean by it? And why he thinks it's true. <laughs> and um, uh, it's going to be hard to answer this one unless we can say something about this. What is he saying? What is he saying when he says? that primary qualities are really in the body, in, in the external things and secondary qualities are not. Right, so these things all here are the things he's gonna call primary qualities. That appears to be Boyle's terminology that he's taken over. Um, it's related to an ancient doctrine about primary qualities, where the primary qualities were hot, cold, moist, and dry. <laughs> um, but obviously there's been a big change. <laughs> okay, so anyway, so these are the primary qualities. Locke says the primary qualities really are in external things. And all the other, that is, I mean, so, Again, he's already mixing things up here as he as he as he confesses that he will. Right? Should we call these primary qualities or ideas of primary qualities? Well, it depends if you're talking about this or you're talking about this. <laughs> okay. But it seems like when we're asking whether it's really in the body, we should be talking about this. 
right? So we're saying these are the ideas of primary qualities. The ideas of primary qualities represent something that's really in the body. Whereas the ideas of secondary qualities like white, cold, hot, um, taste of a pineapple, whatever, don't represent something that's really in the body. What does he mean when he says that? Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is this when the mention of like powers comes in? This is where the mention of powers comes in, but I mean, it's it's going to have to come in, right? Because every quality is a power. But what about and primary substances are are like their qualities. Primary qualities are not powers, or are they also powers? They're, every quality is a power because it has to be the power to cause me to perceive the idea. But you're on the right track. <laughs> the question is so. The question is. Uh, this, uh, uh, well, no, actually, no, let's start with that. Let me start with denomination. So, denomination, you, you denominate something by, well, it's easier to give me an example than with the final. So here's white. Well, no, let me not even like white. We have this word white. The snowball can be denominated white. It's denominated white because of its whiteness. Right? So denomination is basically the relationship between these like abstract names. I mean, at least between these abstract names and the things that they apply to, them, right? So you call you you call whiteness what the snowball has, but you call the snowball white. That's denomination. It's a translation of the term uh, um, of from Aristotle's Phaedrus. This is how it's translated in the lab. All right. So, um, so uh, there's two different ways something could be denominated from something. And one way is denomination from a real property. And the other is denomination from a bare power. So example of denomination from a real property might be, suppose you think that their whiteness is a thing, right? Remember this word real comes from race, which means thing. Right, so suppose you think whiteness is a thing. So here's the snowball. And here's the snowball's whiteness. So the snowball is denominated white because of its relationship to this other thing. It's whiteness. That's denomination for real power, a real property. Denomination from a bare power. Well, I mean, so um, think of the example that Locke gives, like the sun has the power to melt wax. Um, actually, maybe this is confusing because you know, I can't confuse that, but the sun, I'm gonna draw it. Probably can't see the wax thing. But the sun has the power to melt wax. Can you see this at all, or is it all behind my computer? Okay. <laughs> so, um, like, uh, where is the power to melt wax? Well, uh, I mean, when the wax is there, uh, I mean, 
The power is there because there's an operation. Right? Like the sun is actually melting the wax. But suppose you take away the wax. Now where's the power? In the sun, but it's like it's not different from the rest of the sun. There's no thing that is the power. That's the idea. I mean, it's this is a this it's a difficult idea to get across because there's no uncontroversial examples. <laughs> Right? Like, um, the people who make this distinction don't agree about which are cases of this and which are cases of this. Seems like you could make the case that it's all their powers. That's kind of what Marco was going to do, right? Like, it yes. sure seems like filling space is inherent to a, a, I don't know, chair. But if anybody checked on the chair when nothing else is around, well, I okay, that's not exactly how Barclay. It, I think it's right that Barclay is going to say that substances only have bare properties, or bare powers. Um, uh, and therefore, he's going to make no distinction between primary and secondary properties. Um, uh, But as far as the chair goes, he says it's not a substance at all. <laughs> so um, yeah, so it's a little more complicated than that. But yeah, I mean, um, so like, but the issue with respect to a given supposed property, whether it's a real property or a bare power, is the issue of realism versus nominalism about that property. Realism says that property is a thing. And it's because of that thing that um, things can be, that other things can be denominated from it. Nominalism says, no, there's no such thing. There's just a name. This is a mere name. It's not the name of anything. That is, it's not the name of anything. <laughs> um, it's just a way of talking about the snow, basically. It's a way of talking about the snowball, like comparing it to certain effects. Of things. Um, I mean, I don't know, other questions about this? Like I said, it's hard to get across. I mean, maybe, see, I could start talking about what William of Ockham said. So William of Ockham, I think I mentioned before, was an extreme nominalist. But actually this one, this case is the one case where he's a realist, right? So that is, William Bakken says that certain sensible qualities are real, are real things, or that is, that's redundant, are things, right? Um, uh, some, it's possible he said that because otherwise he would have gotten in trouble about the Eucharist. Um, and then maybe he didn't know what he was thinking, but I don't know. Anyway, that's what he says. So certain sensible qualities like whiteness, there actually is such a thing as whiteness. Now, like, where is it? It's obviously like spread throughout the snow book or something, right? But, um, but it's, it's a distinct thing from the snowball itself. Whereas he says something like quantity. And like, I, I, I never know how far to go with this because, so quantity is exactly what Locke is gonna say is a real property, right? That is William Lockham and Locke are going to be like basically switch what things they think are real properties and what things they think are bare powers. Um, 
But, um, and it's like I said, it's not just Locke. I think like already Galileo is thinking something like this. But Locke is the one who works it out really consistently, I believe. So, but anyway, so I don't want to try too hard to convince you of this, but on the other hand, I think you can see why William the Bachman would say, okay, here's Socrates. You can't tell me there's another thing that's the height of Socrates. Oh, right. Like so the height of Socrates is just like the disposition of the parts of Socrates. It's not a separate thing. Right, so that would be his argument. Um, uh, How does he not say that about Cohen? Like I said, that, that some people think he wasn't sincere. He wanted to say that about Cohen too. But you can kind of imagine why you might think Cohen is the first. Um, I mean, you can learn counting is something you have to learn to do. Whereas nobody, you know, you don't have to learn to see color. You have to you learn names, but you don't learn to see. That doesn't seem to be directly relevant, but, uh, but maybe indirectly. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, anyway, I don't want to try too hard to justify William Lockham's view because, like I said, Locke is going to say the opposite. So you really have to understand why Locke thinks that whiteness and all the all the um, uh, all the things that we denominate by secondary qualities are were really just denominated by bare powers. Yeah. Um, I have a question about like, the Socrates argument. Like, yeah. Um, for like a snowball being whiteness, like that's the quality of the snowball. Um, how, like, a person learns. Okay, so a person whiteness, the, I'm not sure. So, like, there is an answer to the last one, according to Locke, right? Locke says whiteness is a simple idea. So, if you've never had it before, you can't know what it is. But if, yeah. Is a snowball also a simple idea? Well, no, right? A snowball, like, so, and if 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 someone were to tell you what a snowball was and you were to learn what it was, even though you'd never seen one or felt one, et cetera, they would do it by listing characteristics of snowballs, right? They're round, they're white, they're cold, they're made of ice, you know, whatever. Um, and uh, if you had, if you already had all those, ideas, you could learn what the snowball is, right? So it's 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 because Locke well, is going to say it's because it's a complex idea that you could learn that someone can tell you you don't have to right right whiteness is a simple idea so it won't work and similarly for solidity if there's someone who's never experienced solidity then we wouldn't be able to tell them what it is um Although, if they somehow knew geometry, we might be able to tell them what quality of bodies cost, <laughs> right? Again, that's a sign that solidity is a really weird idea. It's different, right? Like if someone has never felt the resistance of a body, but can understand something like, um, if one substance takes up this space, and another takes up this space, they can't move into each other, right? You don't have to have felt to, to understand that. So is it, is it possible for us to have another experience? Probably not. Are 
allow you to like, take the space that experiences the living in the song. Yes. So is it, I don't think it's possible for like a, a body to be a body which is solid and not experience that experience the living. So is it, Oh, um, you know, that's probably right. I mean, it's a little complicated. Like if you imagine, this is called the floating man example from Avicenna. Like you imagine someone is just floating in the air. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, uh, and it's dark and whatever. Like, I don't know, maybe they don't. Or like if you imagine now someone's float in a science fiction version someone's floating in a sensory deprivation tank right like i mean it, have they experienced solidity or not i i don't know but anyway i think it's right that Locke says that this is the idea that we have most constantly right there's always something under us that's supporting us or you know we're always touching things or touching our clothes you know so um and I think it's it's really important that it's the sense that we have like gray bodies, as you're saying, right? So that touch is somehow the most fundamental sense. Um, uh, I'll, 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 that will come up again later. But for now, I want to go back to the. Oh. <laughs> okay, so so the answer to this one, what it means, I think, is, and I mean, I, this he says this pretty clearly. He says that the difference between the ideas of primary qualities and the ideas of secondary qualities, is that um, primary qualities, or I guess, yeah. see, let me put that again. Um, this is very hard to keep straight. Let me put that again better. The difference between primary qualities and secondary qualities, that is the powers in the body, is that secondary qualities are bare powers, but primary qualities are real properties. I mean, they're also powers. As Josephine was asking, are they also powers? Yes, they're also powers, but they're powers that the body has by virtue of something that's in it. So they're real powers. And then he also adds this other thing, which is hard to understand, but which I think is really the key. He says, and moreover, our ideas of primary qualities resemble the qualities, whereas our ideas of secondary qualities don't resemble them. So like on the face of it, that's really hard to understand. And this is one of the places in which people will say, that lock is He's such an idiot. I mean, not, not in the technical sense of idiot, <laughs> but in the pejorative sense, right? That lock, he's so he's so stupid. Um, like what how could you compare these two things to see if they resemble each other? Right? Like we only know this quality because of the idea that it causes us to perceive. This is the immediate object. We only know the quality and the thing that has the quality because they cause us to perceive the idea. There isn't some way of like getting out around them and seeing what they look like without the idea. <laughs> so we could compare it. But that doesn't make sense. Do people understand why that doesn't make seems to make no sense? So what could he mean by saying they resemble each other? Um, well, so I think, I guess this is my last picture. That's how I'm going to use this. 
So I think to understand this, you have to take both a more like abstract or philosophical understanding of resemble and also a more abstract or philosophical understanding of what a real property or a real power is. Um, so like start with this. Locke says that there's certain simple ideas such that we perceive a necessary to connection between them. Now, he's not going to say this till a lot later, but I'm going to read it to you now. It's on page 485, book four, chapter three, section 14. Some few of the primary qualities have a necessary dependence and visible connection one with another. As figure necessarily supposes extension, receiving or communicating motion by impulse supposes solidity. Those are the two examples he gives here. Right, for anyone who's in 106, this is an example of what Kant calls synthetic a priori, right? He's saying that solidity and receives motion by impulse, but that's basically like a consequence of resistance, right? So he's saying that these sim these are simple ideas, so they have nothing in common with each other. Right? They can't be related to each other by definition, because they don't, their definition is just themselves, or they don't have a definition. Right? A definition is when you have a complex idea and you list the simple ideas that are in it. But these are simple already. So we can't see anything in common between them. But we see that there's a necessary, a visible and necessary connection between them. So, like, this is basically the same thing I was saying before that when we feel this simple idea of solidity, like, I don't know if resistance is a simple idea actually, but anyway, it doesn't contain solidity. When we feel this simple idea of solidity, when we perceive it, we know that the thing that caused it also has this other property, that it will resist our hands coming together, or therefore that you can use it to push things around. So um, how do we know? We just perceive it, so to speak. We, so to speak, see it. Although, of course, this isn't really seen, right? Seeing is this. <laughs> this is supposed to be like better than seeing. Um, it's evident just by perceiving the ideas. Okay, so what does this have to do with? So first of all, like he he says in that passage that only primary qualities have this kind of visible connect necessary connection. He doesn't say that they all do. And yet, I think I'm about to argue that they all do, and that that's what makes them primary qualities. Um, and this is why. So, like, if we know that these necessarily go together somehow, and we know that, well, I guess I should say, we're caused to perceive this one by this quality in the eye. And we're caused to perceive this one by this quality. Right? Therefore, these qualities necessarily go together. Right? I mean, if we know just by looking at these ideas that they always have to come together, then we know that whatever causes us to perceive them, they must come together. And therefore, I'm almost out of time, so I won't say this in great detail, but therefore, we actually know something about this object. We know that it has a structure that's analogous to the structure of our ideas. Right? In the case of this one, which is a bare power, what that means is, like, all, again, all we know about the object is that it causes us to perceive white. So we don't know what it is. 
That is, we don't know what caused us to perceive one. But in this case, where we learn something about the structure of the object, and again, like these aren't actual little things that move around or something. I mean, like William of Ockham couldn't have met that either, right? But these are like um, distinguishable structural moments of the nature of the object. And, they, and we know that, they, that, that they're there because they have to be analogous. And, I, and now I say one thing that resemble can mean is, the resemblance can mean is analogy. That's like in a strict metaphysical context, that's what it would mean, right? Like A is to B as C is to D. This is a resemblance. When Locke, when Locke says that the primary qualities resemble our ideas, he means that they have an analogous structure and that therefore we actually know something about the object. We know what it is that causes us to feel solidity, namely something that resists the motion of our hands. Okay, that's all I have time to say. Take no, I take like a lot of I would say that I can just as easily say that I know something that causes me to feel red has a structure of red. 